Welcome back to Media 7. Standing up on the stage and trying to make paying customers laugh is a vulnerable, if sometimes exhilarating, pursuit. Why do people do it? And while this bar can easily fill up with punters on the midweek night, where does a comic career go? With me to discuss the trade are Mike King, Jan Marie and Jeremy Corbett. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now Mike, I feel I should ask why a man embarks on a comedy career in the first place and I'm guessing it's not for the money. Uh, fame, fortune, money, yeah all of those things are part of it I, I guess and um, just a need to vent anger in a, in a way that makes people laugh and makes people think about it. So that was the basis of what you did? The, the, no, not the, me. It was the no, angry no, no. guy, right? I did it for a pork Generous. commercial. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Do you and other comics tend to harbour more sophisticated ideas? Have you got the script in the top drawer that you'd like to get made one day? Oh, I think every comic's got the, um, you know, the great New Zealand comedy and uh, busting to get it out, but, uh, you know, it's... It's a pretty hard thing to go through, to, or pretty traumatising thing to go through to actually get it on the screen. Yeah, I mean, you did get the screen, you had a show. What did you learn from that? Um, I learned that uh, don't take good comedy ideas to TVNZ. <laughs> That's basically what I learned. You know, uh, William Goldman said it best in, um, in Confessions of a Screenwriter, um, you know, um, People who run the industry know nothing. Everyone knows nothing. They just, you know, hope that things are going to happen. And there's a lot of ass covering goes on up in the in the ivory towers. You know, uh, the amount of programs that programmers that will come to you and go, hey, listen, Mike, we want something fresh, new, and exciting, but it's got to be familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so now, basically, when you take them your idea, if it if it if it's successful, hey, we told the kid fresh, new and exciting, and look what he bought us. You know, it's all me. And if it's a failure, you know, I said to the kid fresh, new and exciting, what does he bring me? Familiar. But th this is the complaint that I always hear from comedians. You sit down and have a drink with a comedian, oh, you yeah, went up and saw those bastards at the network mm. and they wouldn't do anything for me. Um, we can't all be lying, Russell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Would you go back there? Would you go back of there course. if you got the chance? Of course you go back. I mean, that's, you know, that's... That's part of um, making it in this game. It's a lot of bruised knees, you know. Um, we were brought up in a generation, you know, where they used to cane you at How'd school. How did your knees get bruised? Uh, well, <laughs> oh, Russell, you, you shouldn't have asked. Clearly, you really clearly is. went to a Catholic school. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, the, the whole idea of school when I was there is they teach you how to deal with failure, you know, and getting up and go again. And so, you know, you've got to be pretty tenacious to get up on the stage every night. I mean, and what we do isn't character comedy, you know. I mean, you can, you can hide behind a character and... So many of those old school comedians come up and go, oh yes, they still love me, they just didn't like the character. But we're bearing our soul, and if they don't like what they're seeing up there, in other words, they hate you, so it's very traumatising. Jan Marie, I thought you were a character. Is this the real you? <laughs> God, yes. I haven't got all the time. I have All of me. I haven't got any time to think up a character. It's a, I mean, I think, for me, it's, it's not a character so much as it is super Jan. I mean, there are certain things that you can say, I mean, there are certain things I can say on stage that my mother will go, oh, mm, but go into her own home and say it around the dinner table. She'll go, oh, Jan Marie, don't use that language here. We don't need to be talking about those things here. So, I mean, I think a lot of the time, it, for me, it's, it's great therapy, and it, it's, it's, what, it's what I want to say. I mean, I go out on stage, and I'm presenting my life and my stories, and I'm just putting a little bit of a kick into them to make them generally appealing. I mean, you can't, my thing is you can't go out and bullshit. You just can't. If people see through that, especially New Zealanders. You know, comedy's favourite duo, the Top Twins, out lesbian sisters, and they pack theatres full of 45-year-old women who go, oh, genius, and they're all patrons <laughs> of the Parnell Arts Society, and I, how tragic it would be in the Waterford Crystal would probably smash if their own daughter came home and went, I'm out and I'm proud. But they love it, and they love going and seeing it and supporting it, and that's bloody great, but it's just honest comedy, you, you know. We're just do, do you have an idea of who your audience is for what you do? Um, 18 to 45-year-old People. You've got a I demographic there. Right. I would, well, I could think... You go and play, play, could you go and play Mate, a room You need to have a demographic if you're going to apply for sponsorship. You've got to tell your, your sponsors who they're going to be selling to. So I'd like to think it's 18 to 45-year-old people. No, I don't think it's a female skew, because I think I say a lot of things that upset women. We might get back to things like sponsorship later on, actually, but I'll go to Jeremy because he's looking lonely. Hey, how's, <laughs> you know? how's that website there? Yeah, sums it, sums website? up my career, actually. Yeah. Lonely. Actually, a, a semi-serious semi question. Um, yeah. I, I found working with comedians actually gave me uh, a lot of skills for doing 
things like this, yeah. curiously enough, that what they say about, about comedy and timing is true. You do a radio show every morning. Have you found that as well, that comedy has actually played into what you do on broadcast? Um, a little bit. It, it, it probably translates a little bit to the moving from stage to TV as well, but a lot of stand-up comedians going into radio, um, within the first two weeks, they've pretty much used all their, all their A game, if you like, and then they have to, as Jan Marie says, start kind of being themselves. So it's a different skill set for radio. And I imagine it's the same for, uh, for TV. You don't necessarily just take your stand-up act on, onto television. But uh, having said that, I should probably, a bit of a disclaimer at the top of the show, uh, another stand-up comedian by the name of Paul Ego, he nicknames me Stuart S in terms of TV because I tend to fuck pilots. So <laughs> I have heard this. <laughs> so I've made a lot of them and uh, not many see the light of day. So I'm really not, e I'm hoping to learn something off the show. I know nothing. No, nothing. So what, what went wrong with them? Are you taking, are you taking the rap for them not, not getting produced? Or I what? seem to be the magic, the magic touch, the kiss of death, me and Paul Yates. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 over, over time with television, I tend, to, I tend to say yes to what's offered and do it and uh, not argue too much. You can invest a lot of time and passion in trying to get what you want on air and, and it not happening for various reasons, usually Chinese whispers, you know, too many cooks, all the rest of it. So now with the TV, I tend to say yes, but um, why I said yes to this is uh, this type of um, Panel show is what I really like. I, I think that's, that's a great way of making relatively cheap, uh, not that yours is, it's fantastic. We're uh, cheap. We are cheap. It's cheap. It doesn't look cheap. I mean, it is cheap because <laughs> here's my payment. But, uh, <laughs> but I like the panel show. I think, and that, I think that highlights um, uh, New Zealand comedians. As you, you've done panel shows and they're, they're great off the cuff. They're just yeah, very talented. Mm, and, and we actually discussed in the first part of the show, we don't have those shows. And mm. I mean, Mike, you, you've, you've lived this You've got a family and a mortgage. You can't do that just on stand-up comedy, can you? Yeah, you can. You can? Yeah, definitely you can. I'm surprised. Oh, well, don't be. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of uh, various... Does that mean working every week? Yeah. Every, every day of the week? I three, mean? four times a week. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's hardcore. It's really... It you know, the thing is, you know, when we're on stage, we say what's in our heart. We say what we feel. And, you know, people make a connection because they know you're speaking from a heart in a humorous way. Uh, what happen, tends to happen in television is you usually get someone who knows nothing about you and takes parts of your act and says, that's what people are laughing at. We'll make a whole show on that. Which is kind of like going to the Seinfeld show and go, wow, well, Kramer's the guy. Let's get him and make a whole show of Kramer, which would be highly annoying. And which is why we look highly annoying every time we're on your TV. Well, if it's not giving away any secrets, what, what, what would you do, given your druthers? What's the script in the top drawer? Oh, no, 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 no. I can't tell you, Russell. You'll steal it. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, you know, everyone's got a, a, an idea. But, you know, it can be any idea. There's millions of ideas in the top drawer. It just needs somewhere to, to you know, put to take up. those ideas yeah. and, 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 you know, put them up. And give it, given a fair shot, as I say, on stage we self-edit, as Kylie said. We edit on stage every night. And there is nothing more annoying than having a producer come along, except every producer except Paul Yates, he's brilliant. <laughs> but have a producer come along and go, yeah, I don't think it's funny. Well, you go, listen here, dickhead, I do this every night. They yeah. laugh at it every night. What do you mean it's not funny? And so many times we've all seen ourselves on TV <gasps> doing a setup line, and according to some, someone else, that's the punchline. You, yeah. you go, this, you know. You also surrender yourself a little bit to the editors and you, and you trust them in terms of the editing because the timing, as you mentioned before, is very important. So that's a, that's a big element of trust. I, I would also say, is New Zealand TV comedy in that much strife? I mean, you mentioned a lot of the shows. You know, it's different now. We don't have a, a show that comes out and says, I'm a comedy, but there's some really funny stuff. You mentioned a couple of the shows. And, well, outrageous and, Fortune. Outrageous yeah, Fortune. Comedy. Pop really Sports. I, you know, there's a whole lot of them on there. John O's show, which you mentioned, both of which I've appeared on. <laughs> uh, but, so, uh, so, so they're due to be cut? Yeah. <laughs> they won't have long. Yeah. Jan Marie, if we could go back to that sponsorship thing, because I, I, I thought that was interesting. So you do have to have some idea of what kind of audience you're presenting. You know, it's part of doing what you do, part of the business side of it. Absolutely. I mean, the comment was made in the last panel that, you know, comedians have got to be astute business people. You can make a living. You've just got to be prepared to work really hard at it. And things like sitting down and considering what the, the demograph might be for your show. My, my comedy festival show last week, have you met me? It's very good if you missed it. <laughs> Sad for you. Um, you know, to, in order to get sponsorship um, support for that, for example, I had to look at, I pulled Ticketex, 
ticket sales from my last Auckland show, looked at that. I mean, I'm not a business analyst, but at the end of the day, if that's going to help someone believe in me and give me a bit of cash and a bit of product and make my road a bit smoother, then I'm going to do it. You know, just like getting up on stage eight times a week to make to make the rent if that's what it takes, you know. And I presume you've all done corporate gigs and that sort of thing. Mm. Is that just part of the job? You don't mind doing it? Well, you don't have people to do all that for you? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, Mike. Oh, no, you see. You just, you just wait till the website takes see, off. See, us Maoris, we're very smart in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> you are, aren't yeah. you? Uh, no, we all do corporates, and, and, and every corporate audience is different. I mean, you walk out, and in, in the first two seconds you're on stage, you know, I mean, our material is like a, a jukebox full of songs, hmm. and, and dancing is laughter. If they're not dancing to a particular song, change the record tag. real quick. Mm. That's actually yeah. what I was going to say to you before. It's like the DJ knows which yeah. records work. It's, it's I'll borrow your pen. I need to write some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I've been going wrong. <laughs> this is where I've been going wrong. Just write it on your shirt sleeve. I'll just write it on my shirt sleeve here. Yeah. 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 Carry on, Mikey. Well, yeah. Yeah. But that's uh, the key to it, you know. I mean, I mean it is... <laughs> These are the people who pay our wages, and no one wants to hear about your problems. They just, you know, they just want to rid themselves of their of problems. This, you yeah. know? People so. laugh, I reckon, for three reasons: because they've been there, because they hope they never will, or they know someone who has. You or, know, like... or you pull your cock out. <laughs> When Jan Marie does that. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, oh, yeah. that's my biggest gag. It's huge. Then I like to scull an entire beer and burp and no soot comes out. Mm. Huge. It's, that's uh, where I'm headed. Can we talk yeah, about the reviewers? Comedy. Can we talk about the reviewers? Because Reese Darby yes. on, his, on his Facebook page last week yeah. really unloaded on print media reviewers. Is that a, a, a widespread feeling amongst oh. the... Performance I think it, without it, dropping a, yourselves in it. No, well, there's a bad egg in every bunch, isn't there? You know, and there's certainly <laughs> what, examples. Or comedians? Well, both really, aren't there? Um, but yeah, when you do read a review, and essentially it just spells out the gags that were on stage, it's it's frustrating as a comedian. It's uh, you know, it's like explaining a, a, a magic trick or or a magic trick that doesn't work in my case. But uh, you just <laughs> <laughs> you uh, yeah, that's frustrating. But I don't. I, I think more and more with uh, the, the vast number of reviews now, because of the whole web-based ones and the rest of it, I, mm. I, I think. In in general, they're pretty good, but yeah, it's really frustrating when someone does that, especially if it's maybe in a, a prime slot and it's the only review of the show. Yeah. Mm. Giving away your best stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a, re a review's got to be about. Mm. I liked it, and this is why not. This person stood up and did ta 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 ta. Yeah. You know. The reviews that every comic hates is the one that goes, sure, everyone laughed, but, but. I thought. <laughs> You know, and that's not a review, that's a critique. So just call yourself a critic as opposed to a reviewer. I mean, in my opinion, a review should be what happened on the night. And if everyone laughed, hey, pay me my money. Then that's, then that's a good show. Yeah. Or, in my case, you can have a reviewer that shows up, gets put in the wrong seat, <coughs> someone makes a comment about her and she left before the show even started. No oh dear. Thanks. Yeah. How was the review? Uh, non-existent. Oh, really? Was, yeah, oh. awesome. Yeah. How, about, how about the audiences? It was interesting, <laughs> interesting hearing Ed Byrne last week uh, Characterising Kiwi audiences, well, you know, they're kind of passive, but they don't throw things at you. Yeah. Is that, is that, well, Mark, is that Watson, fair? Mark Watson was in the other day and he said that um, with Kiwi audiences, they'll sit there through a whole show and then come up afterwards and say, that was brilliant, that was really funny. And he sort of points out to them, perhaps laughing during the show would have been a good way yeah. of showing that rather than. Yeah, there's a lot yeah, of that. Worse a few years ago, when me and Andy yeah. Clay started out, and we were in Fakatani in front of 12 people. <laughs> Me, Scott Blanks and, and, and Andy Clay, we did our whole show. He did the first hour, I did the second hour. They didn't say anything, they just looked. And then afterwards gave us a standing ovation. And we were sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite weird. It is quite weird. You guys are awesome though. You guys have been... You guys are tops. Yeah. But it's weird though, kids, if you do, like, like Kylie mentioned the Class Comedians program, um, if you take comedy out, to, kids are notoriously intolerant of... Yep. Like the, if they love you, they'll be laughing the whole way through. In fact, they, can, they can't even stop, wait to laugh till the end. They'll just start laughing at the premise, you know. Whereas or, or adults will. They'll tolerate rubbish. Or they'll, toler or they'll sit through a show quite quietly, you, you know, until the end, which is I find mm. really weird. It's kind of like, snap right. out of it. We're just going to take a break now. Look, okay. at, some, look at some proper foreign comedy. Yeah. Um, time proper now for a news match stuff. from the wide <laughs> world of comedy. Ah, the golden era of British comedy. Remember the classics? Is it? You've only got three days to live. <laughs> Starting from now. 
Tick tock, tick tock. You could hardly do otherwise, given that they're stuck on repeat. First, there was Red Dwarf, brought back from deep space last month for a wildly self referential three parter. Serious, look. Red Dwarf. This is us. It's a TV series about us. To promote a channel full of old TV comedy. You have no idea what's coming. Then there's that 70s classic, The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, with a new lead in Martin Clunes and a snappier title, but the same old jokes. Certainly, Sir Jay. At any time this morning, it suits me best. Certainly, Sir Jay. Seeing Sir Jay, four o'clock this afternoon. I can't do this morning, but I'm free from two. Your office, 11.30, fine. <laughs> and in a blaze of publicity, and yet more channel promotion, British viewers got a reunion documentary last weekend. Faulty Towers is still acknowledged as the benchmark by which all other sitcoms are measured. During the hour and a half, that's equivalent to a quarter of all the episodes actually made, John Cleese revealed that the beloved Faulty Towers was made in spite of the BBC brass. The funny thing was how everyone got everything wrong. I mean, even the guy who at that time was reading scripts for light entertainment, he said, I'm afraid I thought this one as dire as its title. It's a kind of Prince of Denmark of the hotel world, a collection of cliches and stock characters, which I can't see being anything but a disaster. But it just shows you see, people have no idea what they're doing. Perhaps the best writers are in the White House now. Barely had he been introduced at the White House Correspondents' Dinner by their version of Jane Clifton, than Barack Obama started peeling off the lines. Dick Cheney was supposed to be here, uh, but he is very busy working on his memoirs, tentatively titled, How to Shoot Friends and Interrogate People. <laughs> Which brings me to another thing that's changed in, in this new, warmer, fuzzier White House. Uh, and that's my relationship with Hillary. Uh, you know, we had been rivals during the campaign, uh, but these days we could not be closer. In fact, uh, the second she got back from Mexico, she pulled me into a hug and gave me a big kiss. <laughs> told me I better get down there myself. <laughs> Which I really appreciated. I mean, it was, it was nice. What would you make of that, guys? I think Good timing, should, isn't it? I think we he's, should get that guy down here. He, yeah, he's making a great he's TV great. show. He just got more comedy airtime than I've got this year, so... <laughs> <laughs> Be both your brother. He was and, good. He was good. And, and on that sad note for Jeremy, we're going to end the show this week. Thank you to all our panellists, Kylie Aitchison, Paul Yates and Dave Armstrong, and Mike King, Jan Marie and Jeremy Corbett. We'll be back with Media 7 next week, but for now, I'll leave you with the words of Charlie Chaplin. Life is a tragedy when seen in close-up, but a comedy in long shot. To which the panellists and I might add, just make sure you get our good side. Goodbye. <laughs>